Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and today's guest is a writer, educator, and futurist working to bring a greater sense of sanity and justice to education. He studied religion and philosophy at Hampshire College and then later educational neuroscience, human development, and educational philosophy at Harvard. He's the co-founder of Lectica Inc., a non-for-profit dedicated to transforming standardized testing for K-12 higher schooling and business. He's also the author of An Edu Education in a Time Between Worlds, a powerful book that explores the future of schools, technology, and society. Zach Stein, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I want to set some context before we begin. So there are several topics I wanted to speak to you today, but I really want to focus on education. And uh, this is an important topic for me because learning is one of my favorite things to do. And the role of an educator is one of my favorite ones to play. I also feel like I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder due to my own lackluster experience with schooling. I never felt like the school systems I was embedded in supported me in the discovery or the growth of my passions and talents. And I think that I only really started to learn after I graduated college and pursued my own interests and curiosity. And the relevance of this topic continues to grow in my life because now I have two children and my oldest son is about to turn three. So my wife and I are starting to think about how we want to educate our little ones. And while we're unsure what method will be the best, we both can agree that we don't want our children to get the type of education we received in our youth. Um, before we really get into looking at some of the limitations of today's dominant schooling systems and potential pathways for better education, I'd love it if you could speak on the crisis of education and how it relates to other crises of our times. Mm. Yeah, no. And uh, yeah, education is very real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like um, uh, everyone's affected, right? Everyone went through schools. And many people have kids, they, they'll go through schools. Um, and so that means that everyone has an opinion about education, like a strong opinion, often, usually, in a way you don't have about biochemistry or geology or something, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and so that makes educational philosophy in particular, a really engaging field, because anyone, you can talk to anyone or everyone about the nature of education. And when I get into these conversations, I usually try to bring the point home that in fact, education is the root of everything. That if you look at the nature of our culture, at the nature of our society, specifically at the nature of the multiple compounding global crises that we face, that it's, it doesn't take too much reflection to see how they all resulted as downstream effects of the way we've been educating, right? That the root of the so-called meta crisis is in fact a deeper crisis of education, that the ecological crisis which appears to be a crisis of CO2 in the atmosphere and the externalities of technology and all those things. And it is that it's a material crisis in the material world. It is actually more fundamentally also a choice-making crisis, a decision-making crisis, a crisis of consciousness, which means it's a crisis of education, which means we've raised generations of people to be thinking and feeling inappropriately about the natural world and about the inappropriately about the relation between technology and their choices in the natural world. And the only way out <laughs> of the current impasse, which leads us to basically existential risks, which threaten all of life on earth. The only way out of that is to fundamentally change the nature of how the human mind and human communities work. Uh, and that it means changing the nature of education itself. So for, for me, and again, I'm an educational philosopher, so maybe I've got a hammer and everything looks like a nail, but for me, it, it seems clear that education is, is the root of the crises that we face. You know, even if we solve these problems technologically uh, for this generation, we will have to pass on the knowledge of how we solve those problems to the next generation or else we've only solved them temporarily. So we have to solve the educational problem, the educational crisis, in order to solve any of these other problems um, for the long for the long term. 
Uh, so that's how I see it as fundamentally related, as fundamentally root to all the other issues. Uh, and again, I conceive of education of not just what's happening in schools, although schooling is a big part of how education has been institutionalized in our culture. I conceive education very broadly as uh, the kind of broadest social functions that allow the society to reproduce itself. So I conceive it as what's sometimes called like social autopoiesis. Autopoiesis is a Greek word that means self-writing or self-making. It's been used in biology to talk about the work that an organism does to maintain being itself. Like you have to do work to reproduce your physiology and you're just working to maintain yourself. So education is the autopoetic function of society. It's the work a society does to continue being itself, which means it infuses all aspects of society, it's family, school, media, culture, law, economics, all of these things have educational influences. They change how the next generation comes to take on the responsibilities, roles, personalities that are needed to keep the society going. So if you have an educational crisis, it's bad enough across multiple systems of education then the society actually can't reproduce itself, right? Which means that there are social roles in the society that need to be filled, which the next generation literally doesn't have the skills or capacity to fill, right? And so this is a, this is a recipe for civilizational collapse. When you've made a complex society and many of the key roles need to be filled in that society or have become so complex, we can't actually get people back up into those roles. <laughs> uh, and... Some of it is that we, we've lost the capacity to pass on complex skill acquisition. Some of it's that. Some of it's that is that we've lost the capacity to legitimize the system into which young people are being asked to move, which is to say it's a legitimation crisis. It's not that they can't learn or we don't know how to teach them. It's that they're saying, why the hell should I learn this? <laughs> like, why? Why should I work so hard to go get a job in this system? or this government, which hasn't been able to make itself legitimate in my eyes. So there's a capabilities crisis, which we can't reproduce the capabilities we need to keep the society going. But then more found fundamentally, in many ways, there's a legitimation crisis, which is that we actually don't have, we haven't been able to convince young people that they should actually care about contributing to this civilization. Um, so in ADHD, many of the forms of academic underperformance, which we'd like to medicalize, that's a whole other conversation, but many of those forms of academic underperformance are actually a result of this legitimation crisis. Uh, it's, it's not that the kid can't do it. It's that you actually haven't given him a good enough reason to do it. <laughs> uh, and that is deep. And so it's a multifaceted educational crisis. Uh, not just technological or technical problem of improving curriculum to get skill acquisition. It's also a moral, ethical, political problem of actually legitimating this civilization in the eyes of the upcoming generations or else they just won't buy in and they'll just refuse to contribute. And then the thing will degrade quite rapidly. Um, and that's, I, I think, frankly, the situation more or less we're in <laughs> uh, is that. So that's a, a kind of a way in kind of an initial few thoughts there yeah uh, it's really a powerful framing and um such a broad overview to see education in so many different ways and um like you said schooling is only one form but i i'd really like to kind of look a little bit at schooling because um you know this is really relevant in my life right now I've got two little ones and um, me and my wife have been kind of going back and forth about what we want to do with them uh and actually um, one of my wife's friends works in a public school. Um, we're, at, we're in New York. And uh, she sent her a bunch of texts, uh, which I think summarize the situation in many schools fairly well. And what she writes is also very representative of my own experience in school. So I just want to kind of read some of this and then. Nice. Is there, te is there text from an actual teacher in the New York schools? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if she's a count. I think she might be a counselor, but she All works. Right. Yeah, she works she in this. Yeah, so I thought this would be like a cool thing to share. And, and this is just, I didn't edit it or anything. So this is just exactly what she wrote. So she writes, public schools are designed to create worker bees who do what they're told, when they're told, and are too afraid to ask questions, think for themselves, and think outside the box. 
It is a one size fits all model that isn't designed to differentiate or take into consideration the individual needs of the child. If you cannot comply and conform, you're referred for special education. There are some lucky children who end up in a class with a teacher who truly loves what she does and will go above and beyond and do that little bit of extra to make the lesson special or unique. But generally, they follow, in her, her words, a cut and dry as fuck curriculum <laughs> that teaches them to do math this way and picks the books that the kids will read and what they will write and about how that writing will look. The class sizes of 22 plus children unless you're in special ed, and typically one teacher, unless once again, you're lucky to be in a class with two, doesn't allow for any individualized attention or approach. Forget about it if your child needs anything special, anything like movement breaks, a moment to stretch, or they cannot sit for a 47 minute period, some at age 4.7, because that's when K starts for December babies. You will either be deemed a problem, get calls every day, or be referred for special ed. Teachers don't have the time or energy to differentiate. They have 22 kids and their effectiveness and their grade depends on the prog progress and grades of the kids, which in her words, again, is a crock of shit. They need to be able to show measurable data progress. Otherwise, it's not enough. They do not leave room for creativity, imagination, and hands-on learning. If you're a school that's Title I and are lucky enough to have funding for arts and crafts or dance, then you get that once a week. STEAM is a joke in most schools. That's some kind of special program from my understanding. Lunch is 25 minutes and outdoor play or indoor movie is another 25. And that's all the socializing that is allowed for the day really. And there's a ton of other things such as lack of parent involvement. No one really truly cares about what parents think, want or need for their child. Some teachers will extend the invite to collaborate, but the administration and higher ups don't want this too much. So there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Whoever came up with the curriculum doesn't have any clue of child development and what their brains are capable of doing at what age. Because the way that the children are expected to attend and be these little robots of work is really disheartening. There's very little ability to socialize in the actual classroom. The projects that are assigned, in my opinion, should be done in school as a class or in small groups instead of being done at home by the parents. And then the children are the ones getting a greater praise for a beautiful project that is displayed when you can clearly tell a parent did it. The grading policy is a whole nother joke. Extremely boring texts and books that the children are expected to engage in. And if they do not or cannot, then they are deemed below grade level and can be at risk of holdover. The texts aren't reflective of the actual knowledge and doesn't often test any real abilities such as critical thinking, creativity, or problem solving. So um, can you reflect at or expand on any of this? And how does this land with you? Wow. Wow. I mean, it rings. It rings true. It rings true. You know, this is a report from the trenches. As it were, this is not theoretical. This is not, this is not a hypothesis. Um, and uh, it echoes the things that I've been hearing from teachers in most public schools throughout the country for as long as I've been working in the field. <clears throat> um, there's, of course, many, many things to say about it. Um, one thing to say about it is that it wasn't always the case that the large public schools built by nation states were as dysfunctional as they are now that there was a time historically when these things were actually amazing innovations that changed the world for the better. So that's important to get, that we're not looking at something that was a huge mistake from the beginning. We're looking at something that was actually an incredible innovation, uh, which time has passed, basically, of being effective as what it's trying to be. And this happens with many forms of social systems that they're appropriate for a time they pass the time at which they're appropriate and then they start to become counterproductive to the thing they're actually trying to do that the schools are now anti-educational that the schools are making us stupid right that the money is making us poor that the medicine is making us sick right like the the, the institutions start to have kickback effects when they've become so complex and bureaucratized and they become 
their own unit and they seek to reproduce themselves irrespective of the effect they're having on the rest of the society and the people within them. So the schools become an end to themselves. The schools seek to perpetuate being schools the way we've known them. Uh, and so that's just the first thing I want to mention is that this is a situation where we need to kind of look at the long arc of history and think about, especially the American public schools, uh, as at certain points in history being incredibly good things. And then crossing a threshold, especially in the past, let's say, two, three decades uh, with the emergence of digital, when they've actually become obsolete and they are on and we don't know how to take them apart and make something new. Um, so it's also worth mentioning that there have been many, many innovations in schooling as well during these past 30 years and that it's very difficult to, for example, generalize that statement about schools to all schools in the U.S. because all schools in the U.S., especially since the pandemic, have become radically different from one another. So like more now more so than ever in the United States, I'm just speaking about the United States, if you took a random kid out of the school system and then another random kid out of the school system, like five random, like their experiences would likely be so fundamentally different from one another so fundamentally different. We have uh, small private schools and charter schools that are giving certain students literally historically unprecedented educational opportunity, like crazy, like you're talking to NASA scientists in the space station on Zoom with like tons of resources and like lots of individual attention. So like this is happening. There's pockets of crazy good stuff happening. And then we've got other places in the school system that are just inhumane like literally these are inhumane places to be keeping young people um and uh and so that's another thing i'll note which is that one of the things that has started to characterize the system in the, in the states is an increasing stratification which mirrors the increasing economic stratification uh but it's an increasing stratification of access and diversification of access to educational goods which is setting up a much more inequitable system um, so that's worth noting too, is that some people will hear this and they're fortunate enough to have their kids in a school that actually doesn't do this stuff. <laughs> and they're thinking, well, that's not my experience. Well, it's not. <laughs> but there's for plenty of people, this is the this is the main experience. So that's another thing I'll say. I think the thing that stands out most from this is something that I write about in my book, which is the tendency to take what is a social or political issue or an institutional issue. And instead of locating the issue at the level of the institution or the level of the social structure, you locate the problem in the individual themselves, right? Uh, so when you're looking at a kid who doesn't perform well in school, you can ask a bunch of questions about why they're not performing well, right? You can ask questions about the nature of the physical environment they're in, their nutrition, the culture of the school, the nature of the teaching that's being done, the developmentally appropriateness of the curriculum, uh, those kinds of things, right? Which all deflect accountability for the student's performance away from the student and towards the situation the student's in, right? Well, it's not actually your fault, kid. It's the fault of the school. It's the fault of the teacher. It's the fault of whatever, right? That tends to not be what we do. <laughs> it tends to be the case that we think that stuff's all set. The school's fine. The curriculum's great. You've got teachers, you're being fed. Like the problem's you, kid. The problem's your brain, actually. Your problem's your genetics. <laughs> You've got a biological problem that stops you from focusing and learning. We're gonna put you on drugs, right? And so you've gone all the way from questioning the school and the school structure to locating a social and political problem in the child's brain in their biological substrate. And so you, you've medicalized academic underperformance. And to medicalize academic underperformance is to depoliticize academic underperformance. Um, and it's very important to get, which is that, you know, schooling is not a technical thing. Schooling is a political, social, ethical thing, which means that if there's a problem with what's taking place, it's a political, social, ethical problem. It's not a biological problem with the kid's brain. If you turn a social, political problem into a biological problem, you just medicalized deviance, basically. If you medicalize political deviance, which we also do in political discourse, oh, I disagree with this person's political views, they're crazy. <laughs> like they're literally, there's something wrong with their brain because I disagree with their political views. You're like, whoa, <laughs> like 
like, should we send political dissidents to psychiatric hospitals? Because this is what they used to do in Russia, right? Uh, the fact that you politically disagree means that actually there's, it's a biological issue. It's a it's fundamentally, it's your physiology, um, not a legitimate political disagreement, right? And so similarly with young children, to the, to the extent that we load them with the social problem and then we medicalize that problem, characterize them as somehow basically broken biologically that they can't fit into the system, we've just depoliticized the whole issue. Because now we can't ask questions about, hey, maybe the school's not set up right. Like maybe you haven't given the kid a reason to learn because he's actually sophisticated enough to see through all of this bullshit. Instead, what you've done is tell him that for the rest of his life, he's got to deal with a biological dysfunction that you know, makes it impossible for him to learn. Uh, and so that's just a, a very, very slippery slope, which we are way, way far down on, <laughs> which is deflecting criticism from the socio-ethical political environment of the school and putting criticism in medical terms and directing it at the child's brain. And the child's the most vulnerable one in the whole world. Children are the most vulnerable ones. They just are. <laughs> uh, and so, so that's something I'll note. And she, she notes that in these texts, right? That it's just like, listen, if your kid can't do what we're trying to get them to do in school, don't question the school. Yeah, right? Like question your kid's brain basically <laughs> blame blame the brain instead of blaming the school so that's just it's a sign that an institution is uh radically resistant to change like radically resistant to change when precisely those things which should be taken as evidence that it should change <laughs> are characterized in terms that make it impossible to even have that argument about change All right um and uh so this is a deep deep issue. And so I've pushed back a lot against the medicalization of academic underperformance. Um, that's one bit that I'll raise. And then another thing I'll reflect on is that, um, you know, the, the system of education that she's describing, I would call, I would describe it like high modernist education, like where we took the factory model like literally took the factory model, like grades, like A, B, C, D, those grades literally came from the factory model. And it was an innovation that was done at Mount Holyoke College, uh, specifically first, the first place to ever give grades. Uh, and it was literally taken from an administrator who had worked in factories where they were grading the output of meat and things of that nature. So like grade A meat, right? We know that as a term, grade A, it's grade A, right? FDA, grade A or whatever it is. So literally we took the notion of grading materials from the factory, brought them into the classroom, uh, the regimentation, the one size fits allness, all of that comes from kind of a high modernist theory of large scale public schooling. Um, and that has been changed often. You will also find what I will call like late modernist or post-modernist forms of schooling which attempt to do away with all of that stuff no grades no classes like um that kind of stuff like let the kid do whatever they want like these notions um uh make a small little chart up school charter school that's not preparing kids to go to a factory that's preparing kids to go to like a tech startup right so like you make take a big high school you break it into a bunch of small high schools in the small high schools you get all this other stuff going on diversity inclusion culture like anti-racism like all of this stuff starts to come through these postmodern schools um, which are just an augmentation or a react and reaction against the high modernist schools and themselves end up reproducing a lot of similar problems um so so that's worth noting so what i'm proposing in my book is basically the end of schools it's like full stop like just let's end these things because by the way they, we haven't always had schools like it's been a small historical slice of time if you look at the whole arc of human history and we don't even know how long it is right we're talking like seven hundred thousand years like that kind of like little deep history we've not had schools for <laughs> at schools for like a minute <laughs> you know and uh there have been things that look like schools but education was much more distributed throughout the entire culture and largely in the family and in the religious context um, so the idea that we could have a society where these things that we think of as schools are basically don't exist anymore and yet we have a more profoundly 
effective and meaningful educational system that has ever existed. So I talk about the end of schools, the decline of schools, the obsoleting of schools in the context of an educational renaissance. That in fact, moving into an educational renaissance will require us fundamentally rethinking schooling. And so I propose this thing called the decentralized educational hub network, um, which we could talk about if you want to, but it's, it's not a school. It's a, it's a fundamentally new kind of emergent institution that becomes part of an educational system, which doesn't rely on schools primarily, that brings educational responsibility back into the community, into the family, uh, and makes a tremendous number of resources available uh, in an efficient way uh, to yeah, allow for a kind of radical customization and individualization of curriculum. Like, so for example, the one thing she doesn't know, but which is in the culture of the schools is the age segregation of classes, age segregation of classes. Like again, from the factory, super weird, like sociologically, historically, like bizarre. Like we do that in our society. We, we age segregate the old people, keep the old people up in some place away from us. And we age segregate the young people. And then among the young people, we only let them hang out with people who are their old age, own age, like very precisely. <laughs> like, uh, which is, which is insane. It's like completely insane from a, from a social cultural perspective, like un, unprecedented historically. It's not that young people didn't hang out with young people, but there was a ton of intergenerational mingling like when you were 13 if you were in certain contexts you were a man and you were running the farm like it was it, you know what i mean you weren't you were dealing with adults and in the one room schoolhouse of early america it was all the ages were in the one room right and the older kids taught the younger kids right um and so there's that's an example where it's just like we could do away with that completely like in the educational hub network as i imagine it uh, you are grouped into pop-up classrooms, not by virtue of the age you are, but by virtue of your interest and skill capacity and other things of that nature. And you actually want to organize relationships where the older students who are more capacitated teach the younger students who are less capacitated. One of the best ways to learn things is to actually teach them. And we take away the opportunity from children to feel that they are teachers, to feel that they are contributors to society, right? Um, so, so there's a whole bunch of things that begin to look radically different from the perspective of childhood socialization that could be easily made possible if we just kind of get rid of this, these structures that we've inherited, you know, that are like almost a century old now, some of these structures that we're running schools on uh, and the age segregated classrooms is, is one of those. Um, and you know, it's, it's related to just the function of schools as a means of keeping children out of the job market. Now, this will be the place where I end, which is that it's you can't separate the history of schooling from the history of capitalism. And there's a whole, whole like long other thing to say about that, which I'll skip. But one of the main things there is just that um, we keep children out of any position where they could actually do real work that would help their society. Like... Like that, and if we think about why there's a there's like a youth mental health crisis, this is one of the reasons. Is that you become a teenager, you look out at the world, you see all these problems, and yet you are put in a context of school where none of the work you're doing in school contributes to those problems. Period. Like by David Graeber's definition, he was a great anthropologist. It's a bull. School is a bullshit job. It's a bullshit job, and that what that means is that like. You're doing work, you're working your ass off, but the only person, the, the, the work you're doing doesn't contribute to anyone else's work. It's basically, you don't have to do that work. The world does not need your work. School work is something you do to get grades, to then go to the next school, to then get grades, to go to college, to then go to the next school out of college, and then maybe after you graduate college, then you'll be able to contribute to society, <laughs> right? Um, and so what that means is that kids feel like they're worthless, like there are a ton of problems in the world, which they would like to work on, which they can't work on. And they're actually kept out of meaningful experiences of actual work for most of their lives, which means by the time they get to work, they don't even know what it means to like do work. All they know is how to do bullshit jobs. And she kind of mentions that when she says they're just being prepared to be 
little automatons. And the automaton doesn't question whether the work is meaningful. They just do it because they're told to do it. But actual work, you know, is meaningful. Like I do this. And if I don't do this, I can't give it to you. And if I can't give it to you, then you can't do what you need to do. And then somebody doesn't get fed. Right? That's work. <laughs> um, and so we've actually arranged the system where we keep children out of touch with work intentionally and put them in a position not to be able to contribute to the problem solving in the society that they live in. So part of the educational hub network is to almost resuscitate a kind of guild model where the kids are brought in at a young age into collaboration with experts in the context of solving actual problems that need to be solved, not made up problems that the key, we ask the kid to solve because it's on the exam actual problems that need to be solved. <laughs> uh, like, God forbid, we get these kids to do things that actually make them feel like they are capable, like member of their society, contributing to their society. Um, and this is one of the reasons we kind of like, and you resent children, like it's hard to say this, <laughs> but because they're perceived as an economic burden, Basically, the children are perceived as free riders, right? free riders on the work that we're all doing for a productive society. We've got these kids and the kids can't do productive work. And so we don't really value them and kind of resent them. And we think about them in terms of cost benefit analysis and how much am I investing in this kid and how much will I get back when he finally succeeds. And so we're very confused in our thinking about children in part because we've, we've, we've forced them into lives that are not serious. We've forced them into trivial bullshit work when many, many of them are ready to be quite serious by the time they're 12 or 13, and if not earlier. Um, and again, most prior human cultures had that, you know, like, uh, like to say that people who are about 30 years old now are probably about as mature as 15 year olds from most cultures that have ever existed on the earth. Because uh, you know, most cultures would have existed on the earth by the time you're 15, you've been in a room where someone has died. You wa literally watched someone die, maybe you even cleaned up the bed after they've died. Uh, you have been responsible for your younger siblings in a way that is not contrived. That's very fundamental. Uh, you've been contributing to the economic productivity of the culture that you're in, sometimes filling essential roles as a 12 or 13 year old in the society. Uh, and so I'm not saying let's do away with child labor laws, right? Because in capitalism, like we need laws to protect the youth. And that's another conversation about how we're failing there as well. But I am saying that we are, we are, we're creating a kind of immaturity. We are, uh, creating a kind of immaturity and then we're shocked when they're all so immature <laughs> but it's kind of like well, what do you expect you've given them nothing serious to do for most of their lives and now you expect them to just be mature and serious like no like where can they be challenged where can they learn to fail where can they confront death and birth and reality um not in school <laughs> like uh so so those are just some more reflections there to kind of deepen that. But that was some powerful text. And it was good to get something, you know, because I'm not a, I'm not a teacher. I'm not in the trenches. So it's good to get just that data from the trenches to bounce off of. So I appreciate you bringing that to the table. Yeah. I just wonder how this is hitting for people that are going to be listening to this. But for, for me, it's just um, impact, like what you said and just what she said. And then what you said is just like amplifying and really impacting me. And there's so many pieces there from, you know, not taking responsibility and blaming the child. Something's wrong with the child. Literally yesterday, um, my wife was sharing the, her friend's kid got a report card. He's four years old. He got a report card and he's being graded on all these things. He's in preschool and the teacher's saying, oh, he needs to open up more. And then she's saying something about, oh, he doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to spell his name. And the teacher misspelled his his actual name. And my, my wife's friend's like, how do you expect him to know how to spell his name? You don't even know how to spell it. And then, yeah, there's just so many pieces there. Just like, like hearing you talk, I'm just thinking about my own experience and how I would relate to people that were older. 
And there was this kind of anxiety of like, oh, there are so much out there. There's so much older. I can't talk to them there. It's like an authority thing. And me and my wife were just talking about that. And it, it, it's so clear that that's what I was conditioned to do. And like with this age thing, like you could only be around people your age. You can't be uh, with anybody that's older. Um, so yeah, it's, it's so there's so much that comes up. And then you talk about, um, you know, and this is where I want to bring it into and then ground it into my actual experience with what me and my wife are talking about with our kids and what we want to do, how we want to educate them. Um, you talk about ending schools. And uh, I want to check if this is similar to um, like she's listening to a book called Unschooling. And I think a lot of that's kind of similar to you mentioned the book Deschooling by Ivan Eilich. And and um, so we're like, you know, and the, the whole decentralized model like that you speak about in your school. And I'm just curious how that relates, how that's different to um, like some of the things we're exploring is homeschool pods. And then they have like child led learning. And, and you mentioned that how, um, you know, you know, standard schools clearly have far too much structure and rigidity. And then you, you bring in the developmental kind of framework and say, well, now, you know, the, the postmodern approach is like, well, get rid of all the structure, the kids got this, and it becomes kind of the, you know, also ineffective and detrimental. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, like, how do you think about structure in school? How do you think, how do you, like, what is this decentralized model? How does that relate to like homeschool pods or like, how do we, how do, how would we create this at home, like on the ground, like me and my wife looking to do this with our kids? Like, what are the things we want to look for? Like, yeah, yeah maybe you could speak on some of that. Yeah, absolutely. So a few key things. One is, <clears throat> And this is for like how the child perceives their own experience. Like, and I got very lucky that I was dyslexic and my mom had been trained as a special educator uh, and I ended up being a pretty good musician. So I ended up being able to protect my self-esteem by orienting towards music. Um, and my mom was sophisticated enough to basically tell me like, you know, don't worry about the fact that you're not doing as well as these other kids. Like you're special. <laughs> not you're broken, but you're special. Right. Whereas the story was, I was broken. I'm dyslexic. There's something wrong with my brain. It's a whole other conversation, which is not dyslexia is not a dysfunction. It's a neurological difference that becomes a dysfunction only in this culture. Right. So for example, there are no dyslexics in pre-literate cultures. Full stop. Dyslexia does not exist in cultures where no one has to read. And so it's about my nervous system and this alphabet. But anyway, so the, the point is that I separated education from schooling. That was a huge move, which is to say, oh, there's this thing that can occur, which is educational for me, which doesn't occur in schools. And then I can separate learning from schooling, which is huge. Because the biggest problem is that kids start to hate school and therefore they hate anything that seems educational and they don't like learning because <laughs> uh, they associate those things with what happens in schools. And so the first move is to find a way to separate learning from schooling and create contexts in which the child can come to love learning. That's the key thing. Now, what's a misunderstanding among the kind of progressive postmodern view is that that looks like the kid being completely self-directed, but that's not the case. Learning takes place in this context of what I call teacherly authority. And so this is the big thing that needs to be handled when you're thinking about alternative education, which is what are the contexts and dynamics of teacherly authority that are being established? And I use that word authority very specifically because it kind of like, it's a little bit, when you uh, people get a little bit upset, <laughs> especially the postmodernists that I'm talking about authority, you know, um, to which I say, well, on whose authority are you upset? But that's another issue. Uh, but, but basically you're, it's a teacherly authority is a species specific trait. So like if we go back 600,000 years or 12, 12,000 years or whatever, there's always been teacherly authority, even though there hasn't been schools and teacherly authority is just when two humans get together and something needs to be done. And one of those humans obviously knows more about this thing that needs to be done. The other human wants to know. They both recognize that situation and they agree to collaborate in an educational way. 
So it's like a very primordial type of human interaction, which is actually everywhere. Like you can't avoid it. Even if you want to be a non-hierarchical postmodernist and you don't want to see that there are asymmetries in knowledge and capacity between people, right? Uh, even if you want to think that, you can't get out of that. As soon as you start to tell me that, you've put yourself in a position of asymmetric knowledge about that over me, <laughs> right? Like you, there's, there's no escaping these dynamics of knowledge and capacity asymmetry, right? Uh, and it's very important that schooling replaced what I would call organic teacherly authority, which is a spontaneous relationship that emerges in the context of mutual understanding about those asymmetries. Uh, it replaces organic teacherly authority, which can occur almost anywhere with anybody, <laughs> with what I would call institutionalized teacherly authority, which means that you have authority over me as a teacher because the state gives you power to have authority over me as a teacher, not because you necessarily have asymmetric capacity over me. <laughs> and kids start to detect this very early. Um, and, uh, and kids know about asymmetric capacity, right? They know about artists, like hip hop artists or athletes and other things where it's just like, okay, <laughs> like that guy is clearly better at this than these other people. So they get that. And so the question of, is this teacher that's been mandated by the state that I have to give, you know, authority to, or do they have that asymmetry? Like, it's not clear. So the delegitimation of institutionalized teacherly authority, right, leads many people to just question teacherly authority as a category in general. And so a lot of what needs to occur in the kind of movements of homeschooling is a way to preserve contexts where really healthy, beautiful forms of teacherly authority can emerge. Um, and uh, it's delicate to do. It's very delicate, but it's a huge relief when it actually occurs. Like, because that's the thing, like kids actually don't want to be completely left alone. Like, and I hear it all the time from kind of postmodernist parents, like, oh, my kid's my hero. It's like, what? Do you know what the word hero means? Like, the kid's not a hero. The kid's a kid, right? And if you treat the kid as if they're an adult, as if they're a hero, you're actually doing a huge disservice to them. You're putting them in a position where they have nowhere to look now for teacherly authority. <laughs> like, and they're actually in an unsafe situation where the people who should have authority over them are relinquishing that authority, right? Why are they doing that? Complex question, but they are relinquishing authority. They are actually saying that, no, the little kid knows more than me. The little kid is actually the hero. I'm a foolish adult, right? And this speaks to this deeper generational crisis that we're in, but this needs to be avoided. This is just, we can't, we can't run a society uh, when the older generation relinquishes its kind of responsibility to the younger generation to assume teacherly authority. Um, and so that, so in the context, and there's a, there's a lot of movement in homeschooling, de-schooling these days. You know, what's interesting is that 20, 30 years ago, most of the home, most of the homeschooling stuff was occurring with the Christian right. Like most of the homeschooling laws and all these things were occurring for the Christian right. You know, like they wanted to raise their children in a very kind of traditional Christian context. Uh, and so laws were put in place to allow for that to happen. But now what we're seeing is like a huge swelling of interest among progressives and left-leaning folks towards doing the homeschooling thing. So there's a, there's a movement that's growing that's slowly drawing energy out of the mainstream institutionalized context and putting energy in these kind of like a wild west, kind of like almost startup culture of all these different approaches to, to homeschooling. And so what I'm saying here about teacherly authority and about separating learning from schooling, these are things that apply across the board um, that, uh, the homeschooling context need to be contexts in which organic teacherly authority can emerge and be maintained and held responsibly. Um, and again, dynamic, that kind of teacherly authority can occur between younger and older students, right? <laughs> like it can occur between parents and their children, but can also occur between uh, someone who's an artisan or a mechanic uh, and like, and someone who's not, 
right? Like when I bring my car to the auto mechanic, like he's the teacher. <laughs> like I'm way down here. I barely understand what's happening with this thing. I like point to something that's making noise. And he's like, oh, that's their carburetor. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know that that was the carburetor. So it's like that. And so it's not about, it's not about what we've done in schools, but institutionalizing immovable hierarchies of teacherly authority that are mandated by law and by the state. Mm -hmm. Organic teacherly authority is fluid. It comes and goes. In one context, you're the teacher. In another context, someone else is the teacher. Right. So it's got this fluid. But the ability to recognize when that's happening and to enjoy when that's happening and to seek out places where you can be a student, right? To seek out the asymmetries of knowledge and capacity because you want to find someone who can actually teach you these things. Um, that's what needs to be instilled in the youth instead of this attitude that, nope, there's actually no one who can teach me anything, right? To give up on the older generation because they've given up on themselves. They've relinquished teacherly authority and you agree that they should. And then you have a younger generation that is arrogantly dismissive of the potential that there could even be teacherly authority with the elders. Uh, and the elders who are kind of saying, well, I've got nothing to teach you, kid. Like I'm a failed, I'm, we failed, my generation failed, you know? And so that generation gap, the animosity, animosity between the generations, the only knowledge of teacherly authority being institutionalized teacherly authority. Uh, and I'm speaking very abstractly, but these are really fundamental things. Like, does the child come to love learning? Does the child come to respect teachers and seek out teachers? Uh, and then the final bit, which I'll get for those people who are wary of the concept, is that there are, of course, pathological forms of teacherly authority, right? Like there are pathological forms of teacherly authority. We need to be able to recognize them. Uh, in the work I do for the Consilience Project, I wrote a lot about propaganda. Propaganda is the most obvious case of distorted teacherly authority, right? So distorted teacherly authority looks like a situation where there's an asymmetry of knowledge, both parties know there's an asymmetry of knowledge. So I know that you know more than me, but the, the party with greater knowledge and power and capacity uh, sets up a situation of engagement where the student can never come to know as much as they know, right? That there's an asymmetry of knowledge and it's guarded against the breach, right? This is how propaganda works. Right. You're never going to know as much as the government knows. And they're very carefully telling you stuff in such a way that you'll never find the pathway up to know what they know. Right. And this happens also in distorted spiritual teacher dynamics, right? Because that's the, the distortion of teacherly authority in spiritual teaching is, is rampant. And that's again a situation where how do you know if it's pathological? Because the teacher actually has no intention of you being able to do what they do. <clears throat> Um, whereas healthy teacherly authority, the whole point of the relationship is to make it obsolete. The whole point <laughs> of healthy teacherly authority is to make that teacherly authority obsolete, <clears throat> which means my goal as a teacher is to bring you up to my level and to have you surpass my level, right? And I'm not hiding stuff from you. Like I'm appropriately bringing you in as you're ready to look at the very thing that I'm looking at. We're looking at the same text together. We're looking at it together. And I want you to be smarter than me. <laughs> I want you to know more than me. Like you're the, you're the future. Like you actually have to take up the mantle of the society when I'm gone. Therefore, it, it just, I have to get you to a place where you know as much as me or can't surpass me. So that's a sign of healthy teacherly authority. When the asymmetry is there, it's recognized. But the whole point of the interaction is to lessen the asymmetry and to actually have the student surpass the teacher. Um, and when you feel that with a teacher, like when you feel that the teacher is not strategically relating to me, because if you think about it, it is authority, it is power. So there's a weird egoic interest that a teacher would have in keeping you in your place. Right? You will always be my student. Right? You'll never know as much as me. But when you feel the opposite of that, when you feel a teacher who actually really is deeply invested in you coming to know what they know or, or more than they know, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of love. It's a kind of selflessness that becomes tangible. Uh, and if you've had that experience with teachers, uh, and again, schools run right now, despite the fact that they should all be 
like falling apart. They run on the fact that there are some teachers in there who are doing this. <laughs> like, like love is like holding the thing together. <laughs> Even it's ready to break apart, but there are just teachers dedicated enough and loving enough that they're actually doing this. They're actually feeding children with the love of sincere learning from feeling sincere teaching. So, so that's just worth noting that like there's obvious dynamics of pathological teacherly authority, but it's tangible when you're in a healthy student teacher relationship, like you can feel it, the appropriateness of it, the excitement of it, the shared interest in the progress of the student, you know, um, uh, and the uniqueness of the relationship. Like you can't commodify and routinize organic teacherly authority. You can do that with institutional teacherly authority, right? Everyone this age learns from this woman, <laughs> right? Like just how it is. But organic teacherly authority, it's much more, it's much more unique. The interpersonal relationship, much more subtle. Uh, and that's why the homeschooling pods give tremendous opportunity for the emergence of that kind of organic teacherly authority. Um, that's, so there's like an opening there where we're actually like rehearsing ancient forms of interpersonal relationship with the family, the community, where the kids themselves kind of self-organize to gravitate to those older people who they really feel that kind of connection to, right? And the older people have the discretion to be like, okay, kid, you're not quite ready to work with me yet, but these ones I can really work with. And so that sense of allowing for that flexibility so that any teacher-student relationship that emerges is truly authentic, organic, legitimate teacher the authority. Um, and there isn't any just kind of like strange bullshit going on, which is what happens in schools all the time. I can't tell you how many teachers I had. Well, first of all, I had some amazing teachers, like by the grace of God, who taught me that there is this thing called organic teacherly authority, where it's like, I would learn from you, like on a park bench, like like anywhere, like I'm not learning from you because the state mandates me to be here or I get arrested, <laughs> right? But then there are definitely other teachers where it was just hard to find respect. It was hard to be invested in what they thought of me, right? It was hard to see how what they were teaching was relevant and to see that they had any interest in me really learning it. You know what I mean? So those kinds of, it's just, that just undermines the love that is actually the root of educational experience is actually the love, right? Um, and uh, so, so that's a bit more. I will say that the tendencies in the homeschooling network, uh, the homeschooling kind of emergence, I'm seeing in kind of two vectors. I'm seeing, and there's more, but I'm seeing two big vectors. One is a technology intensive vector, right? Where they're talking about homeschooling and de-schooling, but they're really talking about some new form of like blended learning where a lot of the instruction and interaction is occurring on screen. Uh, and a lot of the curriculum delivery and testing and assessment is occurring on uh, basically platforms that have been built for that purpose by kind of like large software developers who have an interest in improving education. So there's like a there's an emerging kind of pre-packaged high-tech homeschooling industry that's emerging. Uh, and then there's the opposite of that, <laughs> which is basically like a lot of people reacting against technology and seeking to find ways to actually bring kids back into like the nature or the community or the park and being together and working on projects with their hands and, and doing that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, sometimes actually keeping their kids from engaging with technology at all for long periods of time. And so this bifurcation, I think it's very interesting to keep an eye on because either extreme is not where you want to be. Um, either extreme is not where you want to be. Uh, the ideal thing that I tried to articulate with the educational hub network is a blending of these where you use the most sophisticated forms of technology in such a way that they kind of don't override the educational experience, but facilitate and scaffold it. And so I like to talk about educational technologies being, shouldn't like the educational technology should arrange for people to meet 
the educational technology should be a scaffold. It should be uh, a time and skill sharing network. Like it should be many, many things, but it should not be the main modality of curriculum delivery and assessment. Like the, the screens should push you away from the screen that you're on the screen for as, as long as you need to be, to be told what to do off the screen. <laughs> and that's where the, the main event happens off the screen. Um, and yet the screen is doing a ton of stuff. It's kind of knows where you are, knows what your interests are. It's coordinating you on the back end with other people who have similar interests to allow for a pop-up classroom or whatever. Um, but education, uh, it's not that you can learn from a screen, totally can. Um, but there's a whole rich dimensionality of learning that has to take place away from screens. And there's a way to think about educational technology interfacing with um, these homeschooling networks such that they don't become just basically like the kids sitting at home in front of their computer screens for five hours a day, which is what, which is a lot of what I've seen when I see people pulling the kids out of school Again, the pandemic accelerated this. <clears throat> Pull your kid out of school. You think you're doing this homeschooling thing, but really you're just sitting your kid in front of the computer for five hours a day. Um, and uh, so that these are things that I that I worry about. So that was pretty abstract. <laughs> so I'd be curious if there's like more specific or concrete questions on your mind with regards to that stuff. No, um, I actually thought that was was great and really there's so much nuance and like the way you think about it. And there's this ability for complexity instead of this black or white thinking that happens or it's no structure, there is, or there's no structure at all. There's like this super rigid structure. And um, yeah, it's, it's like um, even applying that to the organic teacherly authority. It's like, it seems to me it's, it's how we use power, right? It's like recognizing you're in a position of power, stepping into that role, playing that role and then also recognizing, well, now it's time to let that power go. Mm -hmm. So there's also like this, like spiritual dynamic to it. It's, it, you know, it's like, it's like an ego development thing too. It's like, if you're, you get so, um, you know, you, you just completely collapse and don't step into the role and say, oh, like, you know, I failed and the kid's the hero and I can't, you know, provide anything for them. Or it's the opposite where it's like, yes, I'm always going to be in this position and I'm never going to leave. And, you know, this is what you see with the schools that, it's time to change, but they don't want to change. It's time for the people in, in power to step down, but they don't want to step down. So, um, but that, fr yeah, that yeah, yeah, that that's yeah, good. Yeah, that framing though of organic teacherly authority and just like um, you got to feel it, right? Like you got to feel it when it's time to step into that role, when it's time for you to be the teacher, when it's time for you to be the student, and just having this kind of fluid motion that is more representative of how life is um, rather than how become like very rigid categories of either this or either that. Yep. And it's staying in more in this and space. Yep. And then, you know, you were talking about this is the other thing that I want to speak about is like the, you know, educational technologies and how that comes into play. And uh, this is kind of um, so like you write uh, in your book that today it is mostly market dynamics that determine what educational technologies are available, and there is no oversight or quality control in the educational technologies industries, which are rapidly growing nonetheless. And um, you know, you you obviously mentioned that there's a lot of companies that are doing this for for you know schools, but you know what comes to mind also is companies like Masterclass that create courses with uh, leading world experts who are often also celebrities, and you know these courses are on various topics. Um, but it's questionable if these courses are actually helping people learn new skills or if they're simply becoming a form of entertainment and consumption. So how do we measure the effectiveness of online courses and how, what do we do about this uh, market dynamics? And it's like, you know, it's like, this is going to make me money. So we're just going to keep pushing this. It's like, oh, I'm going to just have a bunch of celebrities come on here. People are eating up these courses that, you know, they're paying, they're dropping the money. We're just going to keep doing it instead of, well, is this actually educating people? Is it actually helping them learn skills and learn things that are improving the quality of their lives? Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. And I'll, before I get to that question, I'll go back to the point about the power and teacherly authority is absolutely correct. Like it, there's a need for power to be claimed and understood. And then to give that power, like what you're doing as a teacher, if you're in a legitimate 
dynamic of teacherly authority is empowering and that the word's been overused to empower people, but this is literally, you're literally empowering, you're literally empowering the person and transmitting power. Um, and so there's, there is a spiritual dynamic there, um, 100%, which is important to see. Uh, and then it relates to this question that you're asking about of evaluating the effectiveness of things like online courses and other things. In my book, I write about, uh, you know, one of the main things that undermines teacherly authority is what I call the educational commodity proposition. And the educational commodity proposition is basically the reducing of educational experience to something like a commodity, which can be quantified and monetized and put into market exchange dynamics. Um, and what that does is it complicates the relationship between the teacher and the student because the student is aware that, in fact, the teacher is getting paid by me to give me this lesson. And therefore, is this the lesson they would give if I weren't paying them? Right? And so this goes all the way back to the sophists and Socrates where Socrates was like, hey, the sophists, like this group of philosophers who were basically working with the sons of aristocrats uh, for pay, teaching the kids what the kids wanted to hear, basically. It's like, because if, if, if you're paying me to be a teacher, then it's in my interest not to challenge you, right? It's in my interest not to put you in a situation where you have to learn something that you don't want to learn. It's in my interest to be a lot more entertaining and to teach you things that will instantly give you return on your investment so that you can make more money so that you can give that money to me. All right. And so the one example of this is like the educational student loan, the whole student loan crisis actually is deeper than the financial thing. It's a huge financial problem. <laughs> uh, but it's also that running higher education on a debt-based model where you're basically taking out the equivalent like a mortgage on a house in order to go to college puts every student in the classroom sitting there looking at the professor looking at their watch being like how much money is this minute of instruction costing me will the loan that i've taken out to be in this classroom are you teaching me something that will help me repay this loan right am i getting return on investment in this educational relationship because I have to, because I just invested a lot. Um, uh, and then it changes the dynamic of colleges because colleges become uh, more like interested in serving customers than in educating students, right? And of course we know classic capitalists saying the customer is always right. So, and yet if you're a student, you actually want to be proven wrong. Right. So this is like a very, and it's, it's like subtle, but it's actually deep in the way we think about education now. And it characterizes the cultures in colleges and universities a lot. And I think explains a lot of the entitlement of younger people in these classrooms because they're paying 70, 80 grand to be there. And I'm paying 70, 80 grand to be there. And you're up here at the podium telling me some stuff that I fundamentally don't want to hear and disagree with. Like I'm paying your salary. <laughs> Uh, how dare you? And similarly with the online courses and spiritual teacher scene, if you are supporting yourself financially by selling courses, then that's going to affect the type of course, like that's going to affect what you teach, right? You become almost financially required <laughs> to make these things palatable, entertaining, not challenging. Um, uh, and, and so like at the end of the course, you ask the students not what did you learn or how much did you struggle or how hard was it for you, but how much did you enjoy it? Would you come back basically? <laughs> uh, so the educational commodity proposition fundamentally undermines uh, the dynamic of teacherly authority. Um, and uh, you know, it's kind of like saying that love, you can't put a price tag on love, right? Like, would you be my teacher if I wasn't paying you? Right? It's kind of like asking, would you be my mother if the state wasn't paying you to be my mother? Now, of course, the state doesn't pay anyone <laughs> to be to do the duties of mother, right? But people talk about that, which is interesting. 
but it's a slippery slope towards a society in which we have bureaucratically eliminated the spontaneity of love, right? Bureaucratically eliminate the spontaneity of love by basically reimbursing people for doing behaviors that appear to be like love, right? And then the kid's sitting there like, okay, does she actually love me? Or is she acting like she loves me in order to get paid by the state? And so similarly with the teacher, does the teacher really care about my learning? Or do they just care about it because they're getting paid to? Uh, and even if it's some complex mixture, fundamentally different than the truly organic relationship of teacherly authority, where there is no market transaction that's mediating the relationship, right? Um, and so that is key to get. And so most of the online educational offerings right now are just like, just the educational commodity proposition just reaches right through all of them into the heart of the content and the way these things are, are working. Um, and yeah, I see it as probably the largest challenge that we face now um, is finding a way to decouple teacherly authority from uh, basically commodity transaction, you know, like, um, if again, and I think spiritual teachers may be the clearest place to see this, you know, it's like, um, if you need to fill this workshop to pay your bills, uh, then you can't teach the most challenging workshop, right? You can't even risk becoming controversial. <laughs> like you can't risk becoming controversial. <laughs> Uh, you have to stay in the kind of like mainstream, marketable kind of dynamics of the culture and not deviate from that in order to not lose your revenue stream as a teacher. Um, uh, and by the way, you probably have to advertise through Facebook and make all other kinds of compromises in order to keep that flowing. And so, so that is deep, like it's deep and it's, it's, a, it's a subspecies of a broader problem that we're confronting with kind of the late capitalist end game here, which is the attempt to just commodify everything, to just turn everything possible <laughs> into a commodity. So this same problem also affects uh, artists and art artistic production, right? Um, it's kind of like you all know that like the best art occurs when you're poor and not getting paid for it. You're doing it for the love of it. And then as soon as you break through and you become famous and popular, like, uh, why are they doing the art? Like, why did they write that song? Did that song come from the depth of their heart or was it actually written for them by a group that has been monitoring public perceptions of songs? And it's actually been designed by marketers to become a popular song. Right. Which it's how the music industry works. <laughs> like literally like engineering biurnal beats and other things to just like addict people to certain types of music. Uh, and therefore it's not spontaneous, heartfelt artistic expression. It is strategically made commodity uh, to sell. And so that's, that's tough. And that's why people, that's why there's actually a premium. It's actually hard to find. Uh, but when you find it, it's amazing. When you find a true teacher, you find a true artist because somehow they're doing this outside of that <laughs> or they're doing it inside of that, but they've somehow blown up that context so that it doesn't even apply, you know? Um, so that is part of what becomes essential for children to understand, especially in homeschooling contexts and as they get older, that no, there are certain types of adults who will help you no matter what. They're not going to get paid, right? They're not going to get rewarded by the culture, but they love you. They will help you no matter what, right? And like that is a message of unconditional support, a message of the unconditional availability of educational resources, right? Um, which is what needs to be given to kids that, that, so that they can feel empowered to rise to the challenge that they have that they'll be supported um and uh that's generally not the one given i mean i can't tell you at what age anxiety begins about paying for college but quite young in, mo in many families not in all families of course but in many families uh, it's one of the most fundamental things that characterizes the entire educational experience of the kid 
where will I go to college? Will I get a scholarship? Like, can I pay for it? You're in a zero sum competition with other students in high school, <laughs> all the way up to that moment when you like, it's, it's one of the most competitive environments, kind of cutthroat competitive environments. Some people are ever in is the college admissions process, right? And a crazy message to send, right? Uh, to children that basically like, no, you're not, you're not supposed to collaborate with people your age. You're supposed to be in the cutthroat competition with the people your age for scarce resources to educational opportunity. Right? It's like, oh, <laughs> how are they going to then learn to collaborate when they become adults? <laughs> when the most fundamental lesson you've taught them at this most formative age of adolescence is that they're fundamentally at odds with their classmates, that they're fundamentally in a cutthroat competition with their classmates with like a zero sum outcome, right? Like there's only one or two scholarships if you don't get a scholarship, you don't go to college. <laughs> right? Like we are neck and neck uh, competing over our own futures uh, as 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, and we just take that for granted that that's like a crazy kind of initiation into our doggy dog capitalist culture that the kids just need to get used to being at each other's throats and, and doing whatever it takes to get ahead and to not having compassion for their classmates and to just like all of that stuff is just built in there. And that's all tied into the education commodity proposition fundamentally. Um, and then the, fi the final thing I'll say there is that testing the my, the first book I wrote was on standardized testing. And that's where I came up with the notion of the education commodity proposition, because that's the main impetus behind testing is the ability to actually put a number on the amount of education that has transpired so that we can prove that we have a return on investment. <laughs> like that's the whole idea. Like, okay, we put this much tax money into the schools. If we put that much tax money in, there needs to be some comparable number that gets spit out by the system that proves to us that that money went somewhere that was useful. Um, and so the tendency towards quantifying educational experience, which means towards monitoring and measuring learning and specifically measuring learning with standardized tests to aid us in decision-making procedures about investing money where the skills and capacities of the students all right, basically turned into objects for cost benefit analysis calculations by standardized testing. Right. So I'm not saying that's completely wrong way to think, but I'm saying if that's the only way one thinks about the quality of what's occurring in a school, uh, then you're deeply, deeply confused. Uh, and so it's you have to see the relationship between the commodification of everything as related to the tendency towards the measuring and quantification of everything, um, and therefore the monetization of everything. Um, and uh, so that's just kind of more reflections, more reflections on that. So, um, you know, this is why guild models, collaborative or collective models, co-op models, um, those types of models create social containers where you can avoid having overriding dominance of the educational commodity proposition. And, uh, and those are structures where there's a shared investment by everyone in the thing that's being created, uh, as opposed to like you coming from the outside, paying for access, hanging out there for a bit and leaving. And then this thing makes more and more money as more people do that. Like it's a business model. Like you can't run education on a business model. I mean, you can, but then it's not education. It's actually something else. It's either propaganda or entertainment, probably. Um, but if you have a co-op type model or collaborative or collectivist model or a guild-like model, then you have a different relationship between the students and the environment that they're in. And it's not that there isn't money being exchanged, but it's that the fundamental relationships involved are insulated from the dynamics of that commodity exchange process. So there's more to say about that. It's a complex issue. And it just shows that like, you, you know, education as a topic includes everything. It includes ethics, it includes psychology, it includes economics, it includes politics. Like it's all in education, <laughs> uh, you know? And that's, I think, important to grasp as we move out of this era of schooling, which we've still got another decade or so, if we're still around in a decade. But, you know, in 20 years, there won't be anything that look like what we know of as schools, I believe. 
Yeah, there's so much, so much is there. I just want to check real quick how we are on time. Do we have about 20, 30 more minutes or you I'm good to, to go. run? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, cool. I got a couple, I mean, I got a bunch more questions, but, um, you know, one of the f- most fascinating topics, uh, um, chapters in your book actually was um, the chapter you call the global crisis of measurement. And yes. you were you were touching on a lot of these topics when you were just speaking, um, but can you speak on what you call the measurement crisis, and maybe also explain basic structures a bit so we can understand how measurements and standards work and, and kind of how they're that water you know that water we're swimming and we don't see it, but that's like you know that's what is holding everything together, and then we're you know comparing like is this good is this not good and hey if you could speak on that, yeah that. I'm glad you, I'm glad you, that's, that chapter is really the, it's kind of like the esoteric core the book. It's like, it's not clear why this chapter is in there, but then you get into that chapter and you're like, oh man, like, and so there's a few things and I was kind of speaking to it already that there is with the modern capitalist world system, a tendency towards expanding the realms of what counts as a commodity, which means expanding the realm of what can be brought up into market transaction, which means expanding the realm of what can be bought. <laughs> and if you're buying things, then you have to measure them. Um, that's what that's what one way to think about money is as a universal measure of value, universal store of value. Um, and so uh, the simplest way to think about this is the systems of weights and measures for physical properties that were first really formally standardized pretty late. Like you're looking well after the French Revolution, well after the American Revolution, actually into the 20th century by the time we've actually standardized weights and measures. So you have to kind of let that sink in because like we really take for granted that standardized weights and measures exist. Um, So like when you go to the gas station and you fill your car up, everyone's complaining about gas prices. No one's talking about the fact that you just trust that when the thing says a gallon's been put in your car, a gallon was actually put in your car. Like, was it? How the hell would you know? Like, uh, the point is that there's a little sticker on the gas pump. Most people don't realize this. a little sticker on the gas pump that basically says the state has come and done the rigmarole on this and that it works, that a gallon's a gallon's a gallon, right? And that if I show up with this weird beard, you know, in rural Vermont, the gas station tent can't change it so that I have my gallons a half gallon, right? Um, you go to the counter at the grocery store, you buy some, I don't know, lunch meat or something, and they have a scale, right? They put the meat on that scale, they get a sticker that it's five bucks because it weighed this much, right? Did it weigh that much? Right, but we don't ask because we're so used to standardized weights and measures. They're everywhere. But you have to understand this was a very, very, very recent invention for the vast majority of historical time. We worked with anthropocentric, locally kind of standardized measures uh, uh, up until the metric system, and it was it was a huge problem. It's worth noting. <laughs> like um, there were, uh, you know, many many forms of what I call metrological injustice where weights and measures were used to distort transaction between social groups in very specific ways that biased certain groups. Um, you know. And uh, so the impetus towards the standardization of measurement uh, that came after the French Revolution and through the kind of bourgeois capitalist revolutions, again, like the public schools, the impetus was good. And then during the French Revolution, there was this, there was a Oh, kind of a rallying cry, which was like one measure for all men for all time, right? That was the idea because it used to be that if the king decided he needed more taxes, he would simply shorten the length of the rod used to measure the size of your house. So you have to understand. So like if the rod was this long, right? I'm holding my fingers at a certain length. If the rod was this long, your house was 12 rods long, Right. But if he reduces it, then your house is now 24 rods long and you get taxed for a 24 rod long house, right? So you can see how subtly changing measures allows kind of like a certain kind of power uh, and a certain kind of like ability to dictate what's real. And so we put an end to that in the domain of physical weights and measures. 
And as a result of that, we ended up proliferating around the world a vast and complex measurement infrastructure, truly unprecedented. We're now we're trying to standardize the measurement of everything, uh, like literally trying to standardize the measurement of everything. There's an international standards organization which exists precisely to assure the interoperability of all of these complex parts of this global economic system, you know. Um, and there's many examples of that. But the point is that we are living in houses, for example. I don't know. I can't see. There's probably a door to the room that you're in. That door is a standardized size. Unless you live in a strange place, that door is a standardized size. And the door that goes in it is a standardized size, right? You can pl plug your headphones into the headphone jack because it's exactly the right size. <laughs> or you can slide your credit card through the credit card slide at the gas station or anywhere in the whole world because it's precisely the right size, right? Um, so this whole vast complex economic system functions on the basis of a huge infrastructure of measurement that's been put in place over the past hundred years. Um, and what's important again is that for many of the things, it's fine. Like a gallon of gas is a gallon of gas, right? But for other of these dimensions, especially when we start to measure psychological traits of individuals, um, we start to approach the limits of what is actually measurable and the limits of what should be measured. Um, and this is where uh, the tendency to want to measure everything, to want to monetize everything, uh, ends up creating kind of uh, insane processes of self-objectification. Um, and so the ISO, the International Standards Organization, uh, has a whole suite of standards specifically for human behavior itself. So we've gone from standardizing the width of railroad tracks and the you know all your you know the wheels on your car are exactly the same distance apart as the wheels on my car. So we've standardized the physical world as best as we possibly can in order to make it interoperable and efficient and monetizable. And there's an attempt now to standardize the human world and the psychological world for the same purpose. Um, and uh, all of these forms of measurement are based on ways of thinking about systems that are inadequate. Systems are complex, dynamical. Uh, and most of the things we kind of innovated measurement on were not complex and dynamical. <laughs> uh, and so we think, for example, taking one measurement of something gives you a sense of what that thing is. And that's okay. I mean, if it's your house, your house doesn't change very much, right? But if it's a child or a tree or a weather system, uh, then that thing is changing constantly as you're measuring. So the application of simplistic measurement forms to truly complex phenomena, and then believing that we've exhausted what we need to know about that phenomena by applying this simplistic measurement form, is the global measurement crisis. So one example of that is GDP, right? Gross domestic product, right? A single number, a single number that's supposed to summarize the entire economy of a country, right? Like, that's pretty crazy. Like, and it can mask so much. And there's a huge amount of research about the, the failure of GDP as an index of the health of an economy, right? Like, that so many things you can do to boost GDP and to raise GDP in the long run end up damaging the overall economic productivity of the country. And so there's a whole bunch of things there, but that's an example, GDP, one number, the whole economy. Another one's IQ. And IQ was put in place around the same time as many of these other standards measures uh, around the First World War, which is when IQ became radically institutionalized as part of the army and, and uh, immigration and other things in the United States, but IQ is the same thing. A single number <laughs> that represents a massively complex system, and then that number is used for decision-making as a proxy for the complexity of the system, but it's actually not a proxy for the complexity of the system. <laughs> it's, a, it's a systematic misrepresentation of the complexity of the system. 
So the overwhelming tendency to reduce complex phenomena to simple measurable traits and then treating those traits, and if they're as good as the, knowing the phenomenon itself, puts us in a situation where we are, um, and I use the analogy of like we're, you know, we're, we're like flying an airplane or something, and you know, we're not flying blind, because then we'd know we were flying blind, but we're flying with instrumentation and we believe our instrumentation but it's not quite accurate. <laughs> so it would actually be better to be flying blind because then we'd know we can't trust our instruments. But we're in a situation now where we've got instruments and they're reliably differentially responding to something, which means they're changing with regards to something. <laughs> but what that something is, we don't really know. And so we're making huge consequential decisions based on measurement infrastructures that are actually not sophisticated enough to give us the information we need to make those decisions, one of those being standardized tests. That's where I found this problem. I found it in the schools in the way standardized tests were being so systematically misunderstood about what they actually represent, the kinds of decisions they allow us to make, and those kinds of things. Um, so this tendency towards standardization, again, it was one of the dignities of modernity. Like it lifted us out of this kind of like feudal era metrological injustice, and it created a massively complex interoperable global supply chain kind of thing, you know? And it gave us pants that pants have sizes, shoes have sizes, right? glass have sizes, like everything <laughs> is standardized. Uh, but then it led to a situation where we just kept using that same technique that's well, we'll just measure it, standardize it, measure it, standardize it, monetize it. Like we just kept using that technique way beyond the point where it was still useful into domains where it should never be used. Uh, and so we are now in a situation of hyper measurement, hyper standardization, resulting in hyper fragmentation and near total commodification. Um, and uh, that's very alienating uh, and extremely confusing. So like SAT, standard, you know, classic aptitude test and the IQ tests really affect people's self-understandings, like really affect people's self-understandings. Um, and yet, what do they measure? Nothing. And we could get into a debate about that, but I would argue they measure very little, um, very little that you should base your self-understanding on basically. It's kind of like, <clears throat> and there's another great example, basing your overall health <clears throat> on the weight given to you by your bathroom scale, right? Now, it's not that the bathroom scale is irrelevant to your health, but it's certainly not the only index you should use when thinking about your health, right? Uh, and so similarly with other measures, it's not that they're not, it's not that they're completely meaningless. It's just that they're one insight into a very complex system. And, but the ease of measurement the ease of the bathroom scale. You can just put the bathroom scale in your bathroom next to your toilet. It's like in this most intimate place of your house. It's actually a quite fancy technology, which produces a number about you, <laughs> uh, which can become all important, right? And there's very strong correlations between the availability of bathroom scales and the incidences of anorexia, right? Like that the feedback loop established between you and the bathroom scale <laughs> uh, is an example of the measurement crisis, like at a, at a micro level, because it's about setting up a bad feedback loop between you and this thing you're trying to objectify. And, and it, the thing is kind of you that you're objectifying. So it becomes quite, quite dangerous in terms of the patterns that can be established with that kind of self objectification. Uh, so you kind of expand the bathroom scale problem. You see how that's kind of the same problem with the GDP, <laughs> right? Um, and all of that. Uh, and um, so, yeah, so that's a little bit of the measurement bit. And again, it's a very kind of rich chapter and there's, there's a lot in there. Uh, and I talk about um, a great deal aside from what I've talked about. It's also just fascinating. Once you start to kind of see all these things you took for granted as actually being really pre-thought out for you and really, really kind of radically standardized. Uh, and so we got used to living in an environment that was completely standardized. And this is why some people, uh, when they enter very unique architectural things like ancient temples or houses built of mud by hippies or 
teepees or whatever, and they actually encounter a physical structure that was not built according to modern standardized architectural techniques, there's something like people cry. Like the walls are not meeting at a right angle. <laughs> the walls are rounded, for example, <laughs> right? The doors are not uniform sizes. The windows are not uniformed sizes, right? Um, and uh, so that's just very interesting what the overall effect is on the human mind and heart of living in such a standardized environment. Um, uh, you know, what has that done to the way we think about ourselves and, and what's possible? Yeah, I just want to tie all this in um, and like what's been the thread that's been coming up for me in this conversation. And um, it's like the way that these measures and these things affect us and it, it literally like changes our conception, our understanding of who we are, of what we are. Mm -hmm. And, and it, this is like everything that you've been speaking about now. It, to me, it's like a, a deep, deep, like spiritual thing. It, it, it's literally like it comes down to our identity and how we understand ourselves. And you see with, with the objectifying everything and making everything more instrumentalist and, and with the capitalist system, it's all about, you know, taking things and how can we co commoditize them? How can we sell them? How can we measure everything? How can we quantify everything? And then you see the meaning crisis, you see the mental health issues. Um, and then there's this very black or white kind of thinking collapsing into certainty. Um, you know, like you said, simplistic things, just put the scale in here. I'll step on the scale and the scale will let me know how I'm doing. Yep. Um, so it, it's like there's a, a lack of understanding of who we are and what we are and, and uh, the ability to, to be in this um, in, un, in uncertainty, in dynamic, fluid nature of being. Um, there's, yeah, there's just something there like that, that I feel and that that's, that's happening and that there's just some, for us to change some of these issues and these problems, there has to be some kind of deeper, meta, like a, a, a radical shift in our metaphysical understanding of who we, who we are. Yeah, no, that's right. And it, it's related to, I don't know how, how well you know Ian McGilchrist's work. Of course, absolutely. That that to me is I, like the Ian McGilchrist, I Charles Eisenstein. Like I I see these these uh, you know looking through the seeing the world and through the left brain, like objectifying everything. What can I grasp? What can I understand? Rather than stepping back, being in the hole. Yeah, yeah, you get it. So it's like so those threads come together. And Eisenstein talks about measurement and the ascent of humanity, and McGilchrist speaks about it in. The master and his emissary and it's just very true it's like when you see it as clearly as i tried to articulate it in that chapter it does appear like a kind of weird insanity like oh geez <laughs> like we have we're forcing the world into this matrix of standardized categories which it obviously cannot fit into <laughs> and yet we're we're doing that desperately doing that as if we need to do that as if it's the only way to understand the world is to actually fit it into that box which it can't actually fit into so so it, it's a deep it's a deep issue but it, it is the case i think that we're ex we're beginning to exhaust the limits of it like the complexity sciences uh which again we've known about since the late 60s and the 70s we've been having this like slow dawning of this kind of paradigm shift out of a kind of like tinker toy clockwork universe into like a very complex chaotic dynamical systems kind of universe and in that context it's not that you can't take measures you can take measures but they just mean something fundamentally different um, and so that's one like sign of hope is that as science continues to progress the most sophisticated scientists will begin to relate to measures fundamentally differently and hopefully that will trickle down into the other ways we think about measurement. And then the other one is just that we've reached or are nearing the reach of what I would call like peak commodification. And so I believe that there will be something like a pushback, even among consumers, uh, against the attempt to commodify everything. And so we will create basically like, like demilitarized zones or like we will come to again value anew 
these things that cannot be commodified, that cannot be measured, that we'll start to actually recognize those values, those in a way that we, we didn't even know we needed to do until we started to see what was happening as it was all being taken from us and it was all being, being measured. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the final bit I'll mention is that it's, it also is a very different game measuring physical phenomena from measuring psychological phenomena. And this is where I first encountered the problem was in the field of psychometrics. Um, and, uh, and so it's, I'm kind of much more comfortable with people using measurement to measure physical stuff. It's like, it's great that I can trust the gas station and get a gallon, but it's not a problem at all, actually. <laughs> um, but when you take an IQ test or an SAT test or Myers-Briggs test <clears throat> or one of those personality things on Facebook, like there's so many proliferating psychometric technologies, which are um, basically measuring stuff that can't be measured and claiming to measure it. This is the issue is that it, there are things like gasoline is measurable. Full stop. Like there's all kinds of stuff happening in gasoline. If you're a chemist, you, you like be very complex, but like a gallons, a gallons, gallons, it's not a problem. Psychological phenomena are fundamentally much, much, much more complex to think about, to think about even measuring. <laughs> uh, and there's a whole class of very real phenomenon, which cannot be measured full stop very real phenomenon which cannot be measured <laughs> and in fact in the process of measuring them they disappear and they become something else as soon as you've measured them right and this is very hard to, for people to get in the modernist paradigm where basically the saying is and this is a saying that's used in schools a lot which is that if, it, if you can't measure it it doesn't exist if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist and i'm actually saying no <laughs> That's completely incorrect. There's actually stuff that if you measure it, it stops existing <laughs> because you tried to measure it, right? And some of those things uh, are psychological traits. Um, some of those things are things like creativity, uh, certain aspects of one's personality. Uh, there are measurable, measurable dimensions of the human mind. I was a psychometrician, I actually built really good standardized tests of the hierarchical complexity of cognition. That's what Lectica does. So I'm not anti-testing. I'm not anti-psychological work. In fact, I'm a psychologist who tried to work with psychometricians to really figure out what could be measured. But in the process of doing that, I realized that most stuff can't be, <laughs> you know, uh, and therefore the way to understand psychological realities is not to understand them in terms of measures, in terms of measurement, in terms of number, in terms of quantity, uh, that psychological phenomena are, uh, and again, it's not that you, you can kind of do stuff that may, you can produce numbers if you want to, but the question of, have you revealed more about the phenomenon as a result of measuring it? Or have you actually occluded the phenomenon, hidden the phenomenon by virtue of measuring it? Right. And so like when I'm trying to build a house, and I've got different size boards and I can't tell exactly how big they are. And I measure them precisely. I've just revealed more about that board than I could tell just by eyeballing it. Right. The measure actually revealed the precise length of that board. And now I know exactly where to put it. So when I'm thinking about a person, I'm thinking about, hmm, will I be able to do this training that I'd like to invite them into? Uh, and I give them an IQ test. Right. That could completely distort my perception of them. It could actually hide hide them from me <laughs> behind this number. Same with a Myers-Briggs test or almost any single psychological assessment. Um, so there's a holistic type of perception, a psychological way of perceiving, which is anti-quantitative doesn't mean you can't do psychological science from a quantitative perspective, it's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that like if I'm a teacher or a therapist or a counselor or somebody who needs to know this person in their uniqueness, in their unique individuality, then any number I get about them has to be taken with a huge grain of salt. And because there's literally no category for something that's unique, like full stop. There's no category for something that's unique. Like, sorry, modern science. Like, <laughs> you, if, if you can put it in a category, then you've, you've reduced its uniqueness. You've, 
hidden its uniqueness into a place where it can be categorized. And for something that's not a problem, like this board is unique board. There's no board in the world like this board, but it's not a problem for me to measure this board. Like I'm not really losing much about the board, but when you get up to humans, it's like, no, like you can't just put all of those six people into this bucket of a Myers-Briggs type. Like, I mean, you can, but you've just put them all in a bucket and none of them actually reside in that bucket. Um, take it as a grain of salt. It informs your judgment, fine. But to make definitive judgments and to actually make the mistake of thinking that the number shows you more as opposed to showing you less or showing you just a partial view, like that's when we get into the crisis of measurement where we end up uh, allowing the measures to be much more than they are and allowing our decision-making processes to be kind of like hijacked by a certain kind of quantitative objectivity. Um, and, you know, the world has run on quantitative objectivity, like none of this that we're doing now, the internet, everything, like your window with the blinds and what looks like a road outside, all of that is the result of quantitative objectivity. <laughs> so it's like we need quantitative objectivity, but we also need to constrain the application of that way of thinking. It's a very McGilchrist like point. Right. That, that quantitative objectivity should be in the service of something that's not quantified and, you know, not quote unquote objective. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot, it's a really deep kind of vein of, of thinking. Uh, and it becomes most important when worrying about uh, psychological realities that we're trying to over simplify. Yeah. Um, this has been such a rich and fruitful conversation and, um, really interested about what you're saying about the psychometrics and the testing. And cause like I, at one point I was super interested in all these tests. And then I also started to see kind of limitations of them and how they kind of put you in a box and then you start seeing through that lens. Um, but yeah, there was, there's just so much, uh, there's so much depth to your thinking and there's so much more that we could speak about. I think that we really, uh, got a good piece in with education, but I would love to um, speak with you again because, and, you know, speak about spirituality, religion, uh, human development, uh, ethics, because there's so many of these themes that you shrink together in your writing and your work that's uh, fascinating to me. Um, so, yeah, I just. I would welcome that. This is fun. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. So um, thanks a lot, Zach. Um, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I hope we get to speak again soon. Me too, brother. Yeah. Appreciate you. Thank you. Later, brother.